Statues across the world are being torn down or vandalized in response to legitimate anger about racism and historical oppression. This past weekend, the statue of Boer Republic President M.T. Steyn was removed from the campus of the University of the Free State after years of protest and deliberation. At a meeting of the Council of the University of the Free State, the Council approved the following with regards to the M.T. Steyn statute. Firstly, the relocation of the empty Stain statute in full consultation with the Stain family. Secondly, the process of relocation will take place in a dignified manner. Thirdly, the necessary legislation processes set out by the Free State Heritage Resources Authority will be followed. And lastly, project caring becomes a crucial focus for 2019 and beyond. What is to become of the many remaining statues of historical figures from past eras in South Africa's fraught history? And will removing them remedy the ills of the past? That's where we find ourselves this week on The Story. Contemplating whether statues of individuals who represent oppression still have a place in modern society. I am Rian Grobler, senior journalist at News24, and this is the third season of The Story. You're listening to The Story. It's a podcast by News24. We'll speak to journalists and experts about the week's biggest story. This is what we saw, heard and uncovered this week. All right, we're going to chat to James de Villiers now. James is the in-depth and profile writer at News24, and he has written an explainer about the removal of the statue of Boer President M.T. Steyn from the campus of the University of the Free State. Now, James, first of all, tell us a little bit more about M.T. Steyn. Who was M.T. Steyn? Yeah, so Martinez Tinis Steyn, or Tini as many people refer to him, was the last president of the independent Orange Free State during the Boer wars um, and he t- his term was from 1896 to 1902 but he led the, the Boo nation and the Orange Free State during the Angry Boo Wars and for a large time of his presidency he also did a, the, led the Boos during the guerrilla warfare when the English um, managed to take over Bloemfontein which is the main city of, of the Orange Free State at the time. And interestingly enough, the document that was signed to surrender to the British, he wasn't actually there that day because he had ill health and he, his health plagued him his entire life. So he was a, quite an ill man. But he also made, he also did a lot of work, work on establishing the first monument in the world for women and children, the National um, Women's Monument in Bloemfontein, which was built in commemoration of the, the 27,000 women and children who suffered in concentration camps during the Boer War. And um, a, he was also an avid uh, fighter for the establishment of a university for the people of the Orange Free State. And, and it's through his work that the University of the Free State is in existence today. All right, so that explains why there's a statue of M.T. Stain uh, on, on the Bluefortain campus of the University of the Free State. So tell us why was the statue removed? Um, this has been going on for quite a while. So I asked, I spoke to the SLC president, um, Katlejo Leko, the past week, specifically around MTA's history, um, because I couldn't find anything that directly links him to racism, anything that directly linked him to making overt racist remarks or being um, behind the oppression of black South Africans in that regard. And then I asked the SOC president, was MT a racist figure? Was he a figure that displayed racist remarks and was he a racist himself? And what the SOC president told me, which I thought was very interesting, is he said uh, it doesn't really matter what... um, what MTS said himself, he was a part of a system that represented the oppression of black South Africans and, and, and by therefore, by implication, he is he supported a system of oppression. Um, so you can't disassociate yourself from, from being involved in, in, in the horrific history of South Africa at the time. 
Uh, what the university spokesperson, like here, Loder, told me, which I also found was interesting, is that the statue is not representative of South Africa today. Uh, the University of the Free State today is a, is a predominantly black university, and a lot of their students do not feel that welcome by the statue. The, uh, the, the, the statue doesn't re- represent the new diversity of South Africa, and it actually reminds them of a time when the university itself was created to exclude black South Africans from studying there. And therefore, it had to be removed and it has to be replaced by symbols, by artifacts that is inclusive of the new South Africa, and also feel that, that black students feel that they are part of the campus that, that it is today. All right, James, so this statue was removed at the weekend. Uh, what's going to happen to it now? The, the, the university started a process talking about the, the history of the statue uh, and, and whether the statue should be removed back into the early 2000s already. And in 2018, the council finally um, adopted a motion that it has to be removed and start a process also to talk to the um, great-grandchild of uh, MTS Stain, uh, advocate Colin Stain, about his great-grandfather's legacy and, and what would be an appropriate place for him to go. And at the time, the university also applied for permission from the Free State Provincial Heritage Resource Authority to, to get permission to actually move the statue. Um, one thing that advocate Colin Stain asked the university was that it please be done at a time when it's quiet at the university, when there isn't a lot of students the advocate um, colin really wanted to avoid a scenario which happened at the university of cape town where roger's statue had like this massive um fanfare during his removal and it was uh, yeah and 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 advocate colin didn't want the same for his great-grandfather and then he also asked that the statue be moved to the buo museum in bloemfontein Uh, and then what happened is why it was suddenly removed over the weekend is the university finally got a permit at the beginning of June to move the statue. And, um, and thereafter, they, they set plans in motion, and within a week, the statue was removed. It is currently in storage. The Boo uh, War Di- Di- Museum Director, Toki Pretoria, has told me that, the, um, that they're going to try to create context around who Martinez Tennyson Stain was. Uh, context which was, which was often lost at the university. And, and try, really try to paint a story about the man, uh, the role that he played, and also um, hopefully trying to, to paint him a part of South Africa's national heritage. The, his birthday is on the 2nd of October, and um, advocate Colin Stain told me it would be really great if the, the reconstructed statue could be revealed um, on his birthday uh, to celebrate the man that was Martinez Stain. Well, thank you very much. That was James de Villiers, uh, in-depth and profile writer at News24. Thanks, James. To talk to us about the historical context of the removal of statues and antagonism towards historical statues is Peter Toy, who's the assistant editor of In-Depth News at News24. Peter, can you give us a bit of background about why statues are falling all over the world? Rian, it's a, it's a fascinating moment that we are living through um, where different societies are, are grappling and, and trying to come to terms with, with history. And history is very complicated. When you look at history, you, you look at it in shades of grey and, and definitely not in, in shades of black or white. Nothing is, is simple. Uh, when you look back at the world's very complicated history. Uh, we've seen in the, the United Kingdom where the, the, the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at Oxford University um, is now under scrutiny, serious scrutiny. We've seen uh, a statue of a slave trader, Edward Colson, in Bristol, the, the coastal town of Bristol, being uh, uh, ripped off its plinth and, and thrown into the, into the sea. Uh, we've seen in London a, a very famous statue on Parliament Square of, of Winston Churchill being spray-painted with the word racist. Um, in America, there's a big movement to remove statues venerating Confederate leaders. So Americans are looking at old statues uh, in, a new, in a new way. Of course, in South Africa, it started in 2015, 2014, where the roads must fall movement at UCT. Uh, where Rhodes was removed from uh, in front of the Jamison Hall in Cape Town. Um, But even before that, after 1994, um, there was a brief uh, national debate about what to do with with statues that are still dotted around our biggest cities. Think of Louis Boerta in front of Parliament. 
Think of Barry Herzog in front of the Union buildings. So Rian, there's a there's a long history behind reconsidering statues, behind reconsidering public art, uh, and 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 recently, you know, obviously um, triggered by the the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, we we're again thrust into a situation where we have to reconsider what we consider um, relevant statues and uh, and whether or not we should remove statues. It's complicated. Yeah, complicated indeed. And as you said earlier, uh, quite a grey area. Uh, you have on the one side people saying, tear it down because it offends me and the people and the systems that, they, that these statues represent um, are offensive. And we can indeed historically acknowledge that they are offensive, but then there are others who are saying that tearing statues down will not erase history and should be a reminder of history. I think I, Adam Abib in the, in the article which he wrote for News24 last Friday, he said there are, there are certain historical crimes or misdemeanors that are crimes and are revolting across generations. Uh, it, it doesn't matter in which era something happened, you know, something like slavery, uh, there's no excuse for that. Um, but, but, but let's take the, and, and, and let's, let's not delve into our own history because it is going to be contentious, but let's look at someone like Winston Churchill, for example. Now, Winston Churchill was, is widely acknowledged as the uh, most consequential leader of the World War, World War II, you know, alongside Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, uh, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Because Winston Churchill um, was the leader that galvanized uh, Western Europe in, into, into resisting Nazism, into resisting Hitler. And eventually, he led the Western Allies to victory over Hitler. But Winston Churchill also had very old Victorian and Edwardian ideas about race and races and black people and Africans and Afrikaners. Um, you know, he, he, he spoke of, of Englishmen and not even Irishmen, only Englishmen as the superior race. Um, and he looked down on anyone who wasn't born English. You know, there's a strong case to be made out and British historians do acknowledge it that he was a racist. But he saved Europe and probably saved the world against fascism and Nazism. So do you tear down a, a, a statue venerating Winston Churchill? So history is not easy. And, and we need to also look at and judge people in the context of their times. Um, when Winston Churchill was prime minister of Britain, um, it was a different time than it is now. Should we remove him? Good question. Yes, indeed a good question. And also something that you touched on yourself, Peter, in uh, an op-ed piece that you wrote about arguably one of South Africa's most famous statues, that of uh, the former president of the Transvaal Republic, Paul Kruger, in Pretoria. Um, and you made the point that if he also indeed represented such divisions, he should be removed. Give, give us a bit of context about Paul Kruger and is having a statue of Paul Kruger is still relevant in the new South Africa? Well, in, in, in our democracy, which, which this year is 26 years old, um, you know, we haven't really seen many new statues being erected. And there are many reasons for that. Um, you know, we have so many social and, and socioeconomic problems that erecting statues, venerating uh, old politicians is probably not at the top of our to-do list. You know, we've, we've seen some statues of Nelson Mandela being uh, erected since 1994. There's a bust in front of the National Assembly. There's that enormous statue in front of the Union buildings. And there's one uh, built by the government of Ace Mahashule in the Free State on top of Naval Hill. So those are some examples of new statues. But the Kruger statue, of course, is probably the most famous statue in this country. It sits in, it sits on Church Square in Pretoria. It's surrounded by uh, old buildings built by the, the Transvaal Republican government at the end of the 1800s and the mid-1890s. So it sits very much in context uh, in the middle of Kruger's Transvaal. Um, since 1994, it's become the target of, of much protest. Now, Kruger, for all his 
for all for everything that he did for Afrikaners during the Anglo Boer or South African War, has become a figure of Afrikaner nationalism because after 1948, when the National Party took over, they needed to build a story around the Afrikaner. They needed to build Afrikaner myths. They needed to bolster Afrikaner nationalism with a with a glorious history, much like the African National Congress does. You know, African nationalism and Afrikaner nationalism are two sides of the same coin. So, so even though Paul Kruger was never a member of the National Party because it didn't exist, even though he never enforced a policy like uh, like apartheid because it didn't exist during his time, you know he became intertwined with the nationalists' project of Afrikaner nation building. So you can understand why Kruger uh, is so offensive to many many Black South Africans, many many uh, inhabitants of Pretoria. So so I would argue, Rian, that if a symbol or a statue is such a, a, a big cause, a source of division and uh, acrimony and uh, and hatred. You know, it, it should go. You know, if we we shouldn't erect statues of individuals, of politicians, of people who cause so much division. And I think that's the reason why we haven't seen so many statues being erected over the last twenty six years. Peter, um, last question to you, um, and I want to get back to uh, Adam Habib's piece again. He said, no matter which option is decided on about how to treat statues and monuments, it must result from a deliberative exercise in society, and it should not be the outcome of random acts of populist mobilization. He said, it's worth remembering that it's easy to tear something down, but it's far more difficult to build a new world which acknowledges and learns from the wrongs of the past. What is your take on that? Look, Rian, I I, I do believe that we cannot allow a situation where uh, statues that, uh, that, that are from the past can remain untouched without context um, because we don't live in an Afrikaner nationalist state anymore. Because in the Afrikaner nationalist state, uh, symbology, symbolism, uh, uh, statues were erected as part of the Afrikaner nationalist project. Um, and that project has failed uh, and it's caused untold misery, you know, to so many people in this country. Um, but I also don't believe in it that we can, that we, that, that we should or can tear down everything that was built um, and that was erected over, over that period. I'd much rather see, like Adam Abib argues in that article, that statues need to be augmented or supplemented by something which balances it out, which explains it, which explains the context of the time. I'd, I'd rather go for balance and and context than destruction and tearing things down. Well, thank you very much. That was Peter de Toy, the assistant editor of In-Depth News at News24. And that's it from us this week. I'm Ariam Grobler and our producer is Charlene Ritt.